Ray Bradbury, 30 books, more than 30 books, more than 600 stories and poems, has won every conceivable writing award in, the, in, in these literary genres that, that you can imagine. Uh, most recently, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the uh, National Book Awards. Um, he embodies, you're going to hear this again in the, uh, in the introduction for the interview, but he embodies what we have felt all along uh, in, this, in the writing program that we have at Point Loma Nazarene University, which is good writing is good writing across all types of genres. He has written for television, for Alfred Hitchcock Presents, for The Twilight Zone, for he wrote the screenplay for Moby Dick. He's written the short stories, the fiction, the, uh, the nonfiction, the poems. He's, he's done it all. So I would like us to give a warm Point Loma Nazarene University, San Diego, welcome to Ray Bradbury. Thank you. Oh, this is great. Uh, I got out of acting when I was 21. Uh, the, the reason I'm here tonight is because I, qu I quit acting, huh? because I couldn't remember the goddamn lines. Huh? <laughs> but I discovered lecturing was a wonderful substitute, so I could just get up here and say anything I wanted to say off the top of my head. And, and tonight, uh, there's a lot I want to say because I, I recognize the, the need of many of you to be writers and you, you don't want to do the wrong things. So for at least five minutes, I want to talk about the, the hygiene of writing for you so you won't do anything wrong in the next year. And the first thing that comes to mind is the danger of writing novels to start. I don't know how many of you are writing novels now. If they're going well, you don't have to listen to me. But the problem with uh, the problem with novels is you could spend a whole year writing one, and it might not turn out well because you haven't learned to write yet. But the best hygiene for for beginning writers or intermediate writers is to write a hell of a lot of short stories. If you could write one short story a week, doesn't matter what the quality is to start, but at least you're practicing. And at the end of a year, you have 52 short stories, and I defy you to write 52 bad ones, huh? <laughs> it can't be done. It can't be done. At the end of 30 weeks or 40 weeks, or the end of the year, all of a sudden, a story will come that's just wonderful. That's what happened to me. Uh, I started writing when I was 12, and I was 22 before I wrote my first decent short story. That's a hell of a lot of writing, of millions of words, because I was doing everything wrong to start, of course. I was imitating. I had so many heroes that I wanted to be like. I liked H.G. Wells. I loved uh, Jules Verne. I loved Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, for God's sake. Uh, uh, Jeeves, I loved Wodehouse. Well, you can't be any of those things, can you? you? You may love them, but you can't be those. I loved Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tarzan, John Carter, Warlord of Mars. Good Lord, wonderful stuff. The Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum. You know, I always dreamt someday I'd grow up and write an Oz book. Uh, but it's not to be, not to be. So the main thing I want to start with tonight is, is to, to get you to writing more short stories. And then you'll be, you'll be in training. And you'll learn to compact things. You'll learn to look for ideas. And you, the psychological thing here is that every week you'll be happy. Huh? At the end of a week, you will have done something. 
And, but in a novel, you don't know where the hell you're going, huh? <laughs> At the end of a week, you don't feel all that good, huh? <laughs> At the end of a month, I've been through novels. I, I waited until I was 30 before I wrote my first novel. And it, that was Fahrenheit 451. It was worth waiting for, huh? <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I, was, I was fearful of novels. I, I recognized the danger of spending a year on something that might not be very good. And your second novel might not be very good, or your third one. But in the meantime, you could write 52 or 104 short stories. And you're, you're learning your craft. That's the important thing. Read people like Roald Dahl. Get his books of short stories. Get the short stories of Guy de Maupassant. Uh, get John Cheever, who's done some very good short stories over and above his novels. Richard Matheson in my own field. Um, or Nigel, an author named Nigel Neal, K-N-E-A-L-E, -E, Nigel Neal. Read his short stories. John Collier, one of the greatest short story writers of this century, and you know, you've never heard his name, huh? Try and look him up. He's out of print right now. I'm trying to get him back in print next year. John Collier, English writer. He wrote brilliant short stories. Deeply affected me when I was 22 years old. The more quality short stories you read from the start of the century, Edith Wharton's short stories, you save her novels till later. Uh, there are many women writers who influenced me. Uh, the uh, Catherine Ann Porter, her novellas, uh, all of the short stories of Wharton, um, The Curtain is Green uh, by Eudora Welty, wonderful short stories. The more of these you can take in, and stay away from most modern anthologies of short stories because they're slices of life, huh? They don't go anywhere. They don't have any metaphor. Have you looked at The New Yorker recently? Have you tried to read one of those stories? Didn't it put you to sleep immediately, huh? They don't know how to write short stories. Go read Washington Irving. Go read the short stories of Melville. Go read Edgar Allan Poe again, huh? Go read, uh, um, I was trying to think of some of the other authors to, from the start of the century. Nathaniel Hawthorne, a writer of fantasy. In the science fiction field, many collections of short stories, because they all deal with metaphor. And the sooner you recognize the ability of seeing a metaphor and knowing how to write the metaphor and to make collections of them, the better off you'll be. Then you'll be ready for the novel. Maybe some of you here tonight are automatically good novelists, so I'm not talking to you. You're, you're fortunate that you were born that way. But I discovered along the way I was a collector of metaphors. Now, I don't know how I can teach you to uh, recognize a metaphor when you see it, but if you, the, what you've got to do from this night forward is stuff your head with more different things from various fields, hygienically speaking. I'll give you a program to follow every night, very simple program for the next thousand nights. Before you go to bed every night, read one short story. That'll take you 10 minutes, 15 minutes, okay? Then read one poem a night from Oh, the vast history of poetry. Stay away from most modern poems. It's crap. It's not, po <laughs> it's not poetry, huh? It's not poetry. Now, if you, if you want to kid yourself and, and write lines that look like poems, go ahead and do it, but you'll go nowhere. But read the great poets. Read, go back and read, read Shakespeare. Read Alexander Pope. Read Robert Frost, huh? But one poem a night, one short story a night, one essay a night for the next 1,000 nights. And from various fields, archaeology, zoology, biology, um, all the great philosophers of time, comparing them. Huh? Read the uh, essays of Aldous Huxley. Read Lauren Isley, great anthropologist. You, you can't do better than that. Maybe you've never heard of him. 
Lauren Isley, E-I-S-E-L-E-Y. He was head of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. And he became my friend 40 years ago. I read a, an essay of his in Harper's, The Fire Apes, which was so brilliant, I wrote him a fan letter. And I said, Dear Dr. Isley, The Fire Apes is the finest essay written in the last 20 years in any American magazine. Why don't you write a book? Huh? He wrote back and said, hey, that's an idea. I think I will write a book. And he wrote 17 books. Huh? <laughs> but I was his papa, huh? even though I was 15 years younger. So reread all the books of Lauren Isley. They're, they're crammed with pomegranate ideas. That's why I want you to read essays in every field on politics, uh, analyzing literature, uh, pick your own. But uh, that means that every night then, before you go to bed, you're stuffing your head with one short story, one poem, and one essay. At the end of a thousand nights, Jesus, God, you'll be full of stuff, won't you, huh? You'll be full of ideas and metaphors along with your perceptions of life and your own uh, personal experiences which you've put away and what you see in your friends and your relatives. So you want all these things to go in. And the more metaphors you can cram yourself with, they'll bounce around inside your head and make new metaphors. That's why you're doing this. But you've got to be able to recognize one when you see one. So hygienically speaking, you've got two things to do. If, if you feel you have to do a novel, in spite of what I said, go do it. But in the meantime, write a hell of a lot of short stories. And then every night, do these three things with the short story, the poem, and the essay. And you're well on your way to being more creative. Huh? The next thing is get rid of those friends of yours who make fun of you and don't believe in you. And when you leave here tonight, go home, make a phone call, and fire them. Huh? <laughs> Anyone doesn't believe in you and your future, to hell with them. Huh? I've had my fill of that. I had people I thought were my friends, but secretly they thought I was a nerd, yeah? because I wanted to be a writer. I sold newspapers on a street corner from the time I was 19 till I was 21. I made $10 a week. This is back in 1939, 1940, 41. People came by my corner and said, what are you doing here? I said, becoming a writer. They said, you don't look like one. I said, yeah, but I feel like one. Huh? I, I was filling myself. I lived at the library. I never went to college. I couldn't afford to do that. But I went to the library three or four days a week for 10 years. And I graduated from the library when I was 28. Huh? <laughs> you live in the library. Live in the library, for Christ's sake. Don't live on your goddamn computers and the internet and all that crap, you know? <laughs> Go to the library. <laughs> don't, don't let them flim-flam you into owning all these devices. They can be very valuable and very good for certain kinds of things. Certain kinds of businesses, great. But I lectured at the downtown library in LA uh, three years ago and I signed the guest book, and, but I, the name above mine had been signed the day before by Bill Gates, huh? the great uh, uh, technological expert. And underneath Gates' name I wrote, I don't do windows. <laughs> this, is, this, this, this is the, the highway, this is the age of communication, right? Does anyone ever call you, huh? I can't get through to any goddamn person in the world. I call corporations, and the voice comes on and says, if you want this, press one. If you want that, press two. If you want this, press three. I said, oh, press four into hell with you. So we're being put upon. We're being flim-flammed. You don't need anything but a pad and a pencil, for Christ's sake. I was out in the desert a couple of years ago, and I got an idea for a cantata, Christus Apollo, which I finally wrote with uh, 
Jerry Goldsmith, and we're doing a new recording of it now with Anthony Hopkins. But I wrote the whole damn thing, 18 pages, with a pad and pencil. I had no typewriter with me, so I used what I had, huh? Whatever works, whatever works. But I want you to live at fever pitch. I want you to go to the library, and the great thing about library is surprise, isn't it? To pull books off the shelf and not know what the hell they are. And all of a sudden, after you pulled six books out and said, no, that's not for me, no, I don't think this one, maybe, maybe that one, and finally you pick a fourth one out and you open it, and there you are, huh? a mirror image of you. You're looking for someone like yourself, aren't you? I found uh, someone like myself very late in life when I was 32 years old, George Bernard Shaw. Huh? We're twins, we're twins. Jesus, God, if I were to go to a desert island tomorrow, what books would I take with me? I'd take the Bible, of course. I'd take Shakespeare. And the third book I'd take is the collected essays of George Bernard Shaw. Huh? His essays were just as fascinating as his plays. So I'll give you another diet here. Go get all the essays of George Bernard Shaw on politics, on religion, on women. Long before this age, huh? he was writing about women and their past and their future. He wrote plays about them. He wrote essays. He, he had an opinion on everything. You've got to meet more opinionated essayists. Huh? And uh, I'm sorry that he died long before I had a chance to do any traveling and meet up with him. But you can meet up with him in his books. There's a wonderful book of collected lectures by George Bernard Shaw and G.K. Chesterton, who was one of the great short story writers and novelists of the early part of the century. And they debated, try and find that book of George Bernard Shaw and G.K. Chesterton's uh, debates. And you have ideas all over the place, all over the place. Huh? Then, what do I want for you? What else can you cram into your eyeballs? I want you to fall in love with movies, old movies. I am very lucky that my mother took me to the uh, movies when I was three years old, that's 1923. The first film I saw was The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and I walked strangely for days thereafter. <laughs> Next film, I, uh, the, I fell in love with Lon Chaney. And I saw The Phantom of the Opera. My God, I was five years old. Wonderful. I saw The Lost World, 1925, with the dinosaurs, huh? The same dinosaurs that came up ahead and appeared in King Kong when I was 13. I want your loves to be multiple. I don't want you to be a snob about anything. Anything you love, you do it. You, it's got to be with a great sense of fun. Writing is not a serious business. It's a joy and a celebration. You should be having fun at it. Ignore the authors who say, oh my God, what work, oh Jesus Christ, you know. <laughs> not to hell with that, huh? It is not work. If it's work, stop it and do something else. Now, while I'm thinking of it, people are already saying, well, what do we do about uh, uh, a sudden blockage in your writing? What if, what if you have a, a blockage and you don't know what to do about it? Well, it's obvious you're doing the wrong thing, aren't you? Hmm? You're in the middle of writing something, you go blank, and your mind says, no, that's it, huh? Okay, you're being warned, aren't you? Your subconscious is saying, I don't like you anymore. You're, you're writing about things I don't give a damn for. Huh? You're being political, or you're being um, socially aware. You're writing things that will benefit the world. To hell with that. Huh? I don't write things to benefit the world. If it happens that they do, swell. Huh? I didn't set out to do that. I set out to have a hell of a lot of fun. Huh? I've never worked a day in my life. I have never worked a day in my life. The joy of writing has propelled me from day to day and year to year. Huh? I want you to envy me my joy. Huh? Get out of here tonight and say, am I being joyful? Huh? 
And if you have a writer's block, you can cure it this evening by stopping whatever you're writing and doing something else. You, you pick the wrong subject. Over the years, I've been offered various screenplays by famous directors. But my subconscious knows exactly what I can do and what I can't do. Back in 1955, I believe it was, Otto Preminger, the great director, offered me The Man with the Golden Arm. Okay, it's about drugs. I don't give a goddamn about drugs, you see. It bores the hell out of me. I don't understand people who take them. So why would I write a screenplay? <laughs> by, by, yeah, why would I do that, you know? I, I'd get a writer's block immediately. <laughs> yeah, you can't, there's some things you can't do. I was offered uh, another film by Preminger the next year, a uh, crime book uh, analysis of a famous trial all about stained underwear, okay? Did I grab you right there, huh? <laughs> well, I turned that down. I turned down $200,000 worth of screenplays because I knew if I took the money, it would destroy me, huh? I wouldn't do a good job. I'd get a bad reputation. And so, so what, what's the use of money? now? Another point here, hygienically speaking, if there are any of you here tonight or have gone into writing to make money, forget it, huh? It doesn't work that way. My wife and I were 37 years old before we had enough money to buy a car. We had four kids by then. We needed a car. We got tired of hauling the kids on and off the buses, huh? Now, that's why I was on that street corner. And I started in the pulp magazines, and I worked my way up. My first sales were to Weird Tales and Super Science Stories. I made $20 a story, $15 a story, $30 a story. All the stories in Dark Carnival, if any of you know the book or the October Country, I sold for $20 a piece or $30. Yet the damn book is still around, isn't it? Why? Because I was writing what I want to read. Huh? And I had a fight with the editors all the time. They said, well, we want traditional ghost stories. I said, I don't write traditional ghost stories. I look in the mirror and scare the hell out of myself. Huh? <laughs> That's not traditional. Huh? I went to my doctor's when I was 23 years old, had a sore throat. And he, I said, look in there and tell me what's wrong. He looked and he says, oh, a little pink, you know, take some aspirin, go home. I said, yeah, but I'm feeling all these things here, you know, tendons and muscles and what have you. And he said, oh, that's normal. You've got all sorts of things in your body you've never noticed. The medulla oblongata on the back of your skull, the, the crack on your head that hasn't quite filled in yet. <laughs> and <yeah. laughs> the, the, uh, the floating ribs, huh? The, the, the action of the jaw itself, your kneecaps. Have you ever really looked at your toes? Do you really like your feet? Most people don't, you know. So I went home feeling my bones, huh? And that afternoon I wrote a story called Skeleton, a story of a man who discovers that he has this horrible gothic thing inside of himself, a skeleton, huh? And I wrote the story of the competition between the intuitive self and the skeleton. The, the, uh, the image of death. No one else has ever written that story, huh? And there are no other stories like it in publishing history. So by being true to my own fear, I began to create stories that are in Dark Carnival now, October Country, and Something Wicked This Way Comes. You know. All the carnivals when I was a kid, I went on my first ride with, on a carousel, scared the hell out of me. I was five, I screamed and yelled, to trying to get my mother to take me off. She took me off, huh? So you go back in time and you begin to collect up these fears. Hygienically speaking again, when you go home tonight, make a list of 10 things you love madly and write about them. Make a list of 10 things you hate and kill them, huh? <laughs> go see a film like Point Blank with Lee Marvin 
It's a delicious film. He gets to kill all the people that hurt him in his lifetime. And legitimately, huh? These people, they're all mafia and they owe him money. And you have the pleasure of watching him throw them off the top of a building, huh? And they go all the way down and squish. Beautiful. So make a list of the people you hate and the things you hate and write about them. Make a list of the things you fear and write your own personal nightmares. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I lived back in Waukegan, Illinois, and we, uh, the bathroom was on the upstairs. And there was a single light halfway up the stairs. This light was not the bottom. So if I had to go to the bathroom during the night, I had to run halfway up the stairs and turn on the light. But I always made the mistake of looking at the top of the stairs, and there was something there waiting for me. Huh? So peeing like crazy, I fell back down. Huh? <laughs> My father got tired of that, you know. I said, well, for God's sake, can't you leave the light on? Is it that expensive? Well, well, it was. We were very poor. So they put a pot under my bed. That solved the problem for a while. <laughs> huh? But I wrote a short story a couple of years ago, the thing at the top of the stairs. That's very real, huh? very real. And then all the other accumulations of things that you're not sure actually happened to you, but intuitively you write about them. My book, Dandelion Wine, I went back to my hometown 20 years ago, and I visited my grandparents' house and the house next door where I was born. And I walked up on the lawn, and I picked a dandelion. And the lady on the porch looked down at me, and she said, if I see a man picking a dandelion on my lawn, it's got to be Ray Bradbury. I said, yes, ma'am. She says, come in. So she took me in and showed me around my grandparents' house where I hadn't been for 30 years. You know with the stained glass windows in the, uh, in the, uh, the main area be before going into the living room. Then I walked downtown, <clears throat> and I, I saw the, a barber shop that had been there since I was a kid, with the name of the barber, Lee Wineski, over the, the top, and he used to be my grandmother's boarder when I was a kid, and I used to love to sit at lunch and watch him eat. Some, some people eat so wonderfully, it's a delight to watch them, huh? And I, I knew that Lee Wineski was no longer alive, but someone had to be in that shop that might have known him. So I opened the door, I went in. The town barber, about 75 years old, was standing there, I was around 60, and when he saw me, he threw his comb and scissors on the floor. He says, by God, I've been waiting for you to come through that door for 40 years. <laughs> I said, who are you? And he told me his name. He said, I was your grandma's boarder when you were three years old. Sit in the chair, I'll give you a trim. <laughs> so I sat in the chair and he trimmed my hair. He says, you know, the one thing I remember about you and your grandpa and your brother is in the summer of 1923, when you were three, your grandfather handed you a gunny sack and a nickel. And he says, go over in the field across the street and pick all those dandelions and bring them back in the cellar and put them in the wine press and crush them down and make wine and put them up in clean ketchup bottles against the, the window there in the basement, summer 1922, summer 1923. Summer 1924. I said, oh my God, is it true then? I wrote the book and I didn't know whether I had made dandelion wine when I was three. And now you've given me back a gift of all those years. And I cried, I cried. So I went home and I wrote an article for Gourmet Magazine about what I've just told you, huh? This intuition, this powerful thing that seized me and caused me to write the short stories and then finally the book. All of my books have been surprises. I've never known where the hell I'm going, huh? That's the great fun. When I write my mysteries, I start out with some characters. I don't know where the hell I'm going, but they're fascinating. That's the reason we read mysteries, isn't it? We read for two reasons. We read to meet, to meet all these peculiar people, 
like in the Maltese Falcon, huh? The, the, those weird criminals, the fat man, Gutman, huh? And all the others. And then we read to be educated. Most mysteries are about something, about antique collecting, about being a true Pinkerton detective, about being uh, maybe even a fan fantasy writer, something like that. But you get an education in characters and a subject. You get that all the time in, in, uh, in uh, Sherlock Holmes. Huh? So we read because we're curious and we want to be educated to people and to things. So over a period of years, I read Winesburg, Ohio when I was 24 years old. And I thought, oh my God, if someday I could write a book like Winesburg, Ohio, but put it on Mars with all the characters from Winesburg, Ohio, up on Mars. And I made a few notes, and I put up, I made up a title, and I wrote some characters down, and put it away and forgot about it. Never did anything about it. During the next five years, I wrote a series of stories about Mars. They're all separate. And when I was, when I was 27, I got married. My wife took a vow of poverty to marry me. Huh? <laughs> we had $8 in the bank the day we got married. Huh? I put $5 in an envelope and handed it to the minister. And he said, what's this? I said, that's your fee for the ceremony today. He said, you're a writer, aren't you? I said, yes. He says, then you're going to need this. Huh? <laughs> and he handed it to me and I took it back. <laughs> and later on, when I had some money, I sent him a decent check. But in the next three years, I wrote more and more Martian stories, not knowing where I was going. All of a sudden, my wife got pregnant, which means she had to quit work. She worked at Abbey Rents. She made $40 a week take-home pay, and I made $40 a week when I was lucky, when the story sold. And it scared the hell out of me. Suddenly, I had to be the moneymaker for the family because we had a, a baby coming. My friend Norman Corwin, the great Norman Corwin, the greatest radio writer, producer, director in history, and a good friend of mine then, told me, he said, Ray, you've got to go to New York and you've got to have the editors see you and know that you exist. You're doing all this writing, but they don't know that, that you are in the world. Now, I'm going to be in New York in June with Katie, my wife. Come back and we'll protect you. We'll take you around New York City and introduce you to people. So I went to New York City. I was 29 years old. We had $40 in the bank. Huh? And I took a stack of short stories on the Greyhound bus. I couldn't afford to go any other way. Have you ever taken the Greyhound bus across to New York four days and four nights? No, don't do it. <laughs> Especially 50 years ago, when there was no air conditioning and no toilets, huh? So they stopped the bus every two hours and you ran out into the gas station and went to the men's and women's and ran back before the damn bus left, huh? I got in New York, stayed at the YMCA, $5 a week, huh? That's how poor I was. And I met all the editors and they all said, well, don't you have a novel? I said, no, I'm a sprinter, I write short stories. Well, we don't publish short stories, they don't sell. And I was ready to go home, defeated. And the last night there, I had dinner with Walter Bradbury, no relation, from Doubleday Publishers. And during the dinner, he said, Ray, what about all those Martian stories you've been writing? What if you tied them all together in a tapestry and called it the Martian Chronicles? Do you think you could do that? I said, oh my God, Winesburg, Ohio. Huh? Winesboro, Ohio. I did it, but didn't know I was doing it. Huh? He said, I tell you what, write an outline on the book tonight, bring it to the office tomorrow, and if I like it, I'll give you an advance of $750. I stayed up all night at the YMCA. I wrote the outline for the Martian Chronicles, took it to Bradbury the next day, gave it to him. He said, that's it, here's 750 bucks. Now he says, do you have any other material that we could kid people into thinking was a novel? 
I said, <laughs> I said, well, I've got a short story about a man who has tattoos all over his body, and late at night when he perspires, the tattoos come to life and tell their stories. He said, here's another $750. <laughs> so in one day, I sold the Martian Chronicles and the Illustrated Man without knowing what I was doing. You see, surprise! You don't know what's in you until you test it, until you word associate. You've been writing self-consciously, intellectually for too long. The deep stuff, your true self, hasn't had a chance to come out. You've been so busy thinking commercially, what will sell, what will I do, instead of saying, who am I? How do I discover me? Your word associate. Here's another thing you can do hygienically. Go to the typewriter and just type in an old thing that comes into your head. Start out word association. And by God, maybe by the bottom of the, the page or the second page, all of a sudden, some characters will take over. And they'll begin to write. And this will be your true self, your true fear, your true, true hope, your true love. Huh? You'll be writing a passion. You'll be writing with excitement. Huh? You'll, be, you'll be finding out things about yourself that you never, you didn't even know you knew. Huh? And all the things in your past that you haven't touched yet. You haven't even begun to touch them. I'm still touching mine, you know? So I wrote those two books. And then Dandelion Wine happened the same way. I, I, I've always loved Fourth of July. I've loved growing up in a small town where on summer nights all the relatives, all my relatives would gather on my grandparents' front porch. There were three families lived on the same block. My grandparents, my father, my mother, my brother, myself in the next house, and the third house with my uncle Byron and his wife and child. And I, I, I was so fortunate because he had all the Edgar Rice Burroughs books, all of Tarzan, all of John Carter, War Lord of Mars. So I went over to the lending library at his house. huh? And my Aunt Neva lived upstairs and she had all the Oz books. So I had a second lending library right there in the house, along with Alice in Wonderland and uh, the uh, other fairy tales and what have you. Hmm? And then I had the main library downtown. So between the two I had around the, the block with me and the library downtown, I was set, huh? I was really set. So, but I loved the idea of all my relatives coming from the various houses on a summer night and sitting on the porch and talking and talking. And, and, and you, if you were smart, you listened, huh? I, I loved to lie on the, the big xylophone of the porch, all the, all the boards in the porch, huh? And all the voices would come down through the rockers and go into the boards and sound the boards and then come into my ear when I'm lying there, huh? And if the conversation lagged, I'd whisper, 192. And my grandfather would tell us something about 192, huh? <laughs> or my father, 1910, you know? And so I wrote an essay on this about front porches and summer nights. And that was the beginning of something. And then I wrote, I, I was on a bus going somewhere 45 years ago, and uh, a young boy jumped on the bus, ran down the aisle, slung himself into a seat across from me, and I said, oh God, if I had that energy, I could write a, a poem a day, a short stories a week, a novel a month, huh? What's the secret of his energy? And I looked down at his feet, and he was wearing the most beautiful pair of nice new white tennis shoes, huh? I said, yes, I remember what it was like when I was a kid. My father would take me down town every spring, and we'd take my heavy winter shoes and take them off and throw them on the floor. Grrr! They went right through into the basement. They were, so, they were so heavy with winter, huh? And then we put on a new pair, a pair of Lightfoot tennis sneakers, huh? And when you put them on, you can rock in them, and all the energy of the world is in them, all the lightning, all the storms, all the Indians running on dust paths, huh? all the energy of the world. And I got off the bus, went home, and wrote a story called The Sound of Summer Running, huh? 
So I was on my way to writing a book, but I didn't know it. I didn't know it. And I wrote other essays about my grandmother's cooking. I loved to, to be in the kitchen with her and watch her eviscerate the turkeys. I helped her singe the chickens. I loved the pantry. huh? I, don't you love real pantries? You go in and read the names of all the spices from all the countries of the world, huh? all the wonderful colors and symbols from China and Taipan and, 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 uh, and Japan. Huh? So I wrote an essay on that. And then after about three or four years, I had 40 short stories. And all of a sudden I looked at this and I said, my God, it's a novel. It's a novel about celebrating life. It's a novel about all of life, huh? Without knowing it, if you ask me the theme for the book, it's about all of life, of being born and growing up and, and, and loving the experience of a summer and discovering you can die because you see other people die and being afraid suddenly and being seized with a, a panic of life, a panic of life, as well as a panic of death. And so I sat down and I collected all the pieces, just as I did with Martian Chronicles. And we published a book. The damn thing's been in print now for, for 40 years. Huh? All because I surprised myself. That's what I want for you, to surprise yourself. Not know what you're going to do next, what you're going to do next. Had an experience with Gene Kelly, the great dancer, the great choreographer. I knew him back almost 50 years ago. He invited me and my wife to see a showing of his film, Invitation to the Dance. The year before, he had made the greatest musical ever made, Singing in the Rain, which is a science fiction musical. Most people never thought. It's about the invention of sound. So you, you invent sound and it unemploys thousands of people. Then you have to have other people come in with new occupation. So it's a science fiction musical all about this technical thing that happened in Hollywood in 1927-28. So Gene and I became good friends. And after the preview of his new film, Invitation to the Dance, which was all dance, there was no plot. Three or four different numbers, ballet, tap dance, an animated cartoon with Tom and Jerry. And I walked home with my wife. We didn't have a car at that time. We, were, we lived about two miles from MGM. We walked home, and on the way I said, oh God, I'd give my right arm to do something with Gene Kelly. She says, for God's sake, go to your file, find something, and write it up for him. There must be something there. I looked in my file, and I found a story called The Black Ferris. I I said, this, this looks good. So I spent a month writing a treatment and a partial screenplay, 72, 75 pages, uh, called Dark Carnival. And I took it to Gene Kelly, and he says, this is it. This is my next film. I want to direct this. Will, will you let me take it to Paris and to London next week and see if I can get financing for this? I said, take it, it's yours. He came back in a month. He says, oh, I'm so sorry I couldn't couldn't get any money. I'm very sorry. I said, Gene, don't tell me you're sorry. I'm so honored that you wanted to do this. So since I had nothing else to do, I had a screenplay on my hand. I sat down and wrote a novel based on it called Something Wicked This Way Comes. Huh? Again, surprise, surprise. And the intuitive thing, the remarkable thing about life quite often is meeting people you feel you were destined to meet. I don't know what this means. I don't quite understand what the hell I'm talking about here. <laughs> but I was walking through Beverly Hills one night in 1951, and I looked at an art store window, and there was a, a small lithograph of a, a Gothic Victorian building. Beautiful sort of thing I used to see around my hometown when I was a kid. And I looked at it and I said, oh God, I'd love to own that, but I don't think we can afford it. My income at that time was about $100 a week. But I went to the art store the next day and I said, how much is that lithograph in the window? They said, $75. Well, I couldn't afford that. I said, can I buy it on time? Yes, I could. 
I'll give you $25 and I'll buy, I'll give you the rest in the next two months. They said, well, hell, if you like this, come in the next room. We've got a large oil painting of this same building, huh? And I went in the next room and there's this wonderful painting by Joe Manini. And oh, my heart throbbed with joy and with despair because I could, it was 300 bucks, I couldn't afford that. And then they showed me a second large painting of an idea for a novel I hadn't written yet. Huh? Something wicked this way comes, of a carnival train out of Renaissance Italy. A train in Renaissance Italy with church windows in the carriages, huh? Church, church windows, in very unusual, and all sorts of strange celebrants on the train, and a Civil War engine puffing steam and fire, huh? And I looked at this, I said, my God, I've got notes on this painting in my files. I hadn't begun to write Dark Carnival or Something Wicked This Way Comes. And again, my heart sank, and I said, how much is this one? Five hundred dollars. Oh, Jesus Christ. I said, could you give me, could you give me the artist's name and phone number? And they said, sure. I said, I want to talk to him. So I called Joe Manini on the phone. I said, can I come up and see you? And I went up to see him and I said, look, I'm in madly in love with your work, but I can't afford it. Now, let's, let me make a deal with you. There's, you got one painting down there for 250 bucks, one for 500 dollars. I can't afford that, but I, if the two paintings don't sell and you get them back, I'll pay you what you would have got, which is half price. The art gallery always took 50%. I can afford $150 or $125, and I can afford $250 on time. I'll pay you over a period of six or eight months, but I've got to have those paintings. He says, okay, if they don't sell, I'll call you. A month later, he called, he said, come get the paintings. They didn't sell. I found out later that he had pulled the paintings out of the show in order to give them to me. Huh? Now, but he was painting my mind. Huh? He was painting my mind. Something wicked. We're like this. Huh? So he became my illustrator for 20 different books. We worked together until five years ago when he died. Fabulous child, wonderful. But I was destined to meet him, wasn't I, huh? I don't understand these things. But if ever an artist illustrated a writer, Joe Manini did. So again, surprise, 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 huh? I'm finishing Murder Mystery right now. I started three years ago. Didn't know where the hell I was going. I, I finally found out where I was going about six months ago. <laughs> And I said, oh, that's what this is all about, huh? And the title of the book is Let's All Kill Constance, the lead character in my first two murder mysteries. Huh? I was on the boat, I was on the ship going to Europe 12 years ago on the Elizabeth II. Pulling out of New York Harbor, I was going down to my cabin, a man passed me with the most incredibly destroyed face I had ever seen. It looked as if someone had shoved him in the furnace and burnt his face, and it all melted, and it was completely destroyed. When he was gone, two seconds, I burst into tears. I didn't know the man, but I thought, oh Christ, how can you live with a face like that? A terrible, terrible thing. That night, at supper, he was seated at a table 30 feet away from me with his wife and his daughter, and they were laughing and drinking champagne, and his face didn't exist for them. The power of love, the power of love. Again, I was destroyed. I, I, I cried again. And I got to Paris, and I couldn't forget him. Couldn't forget him. And I had a portable typewriter with me, battery operated, and I would touch typist. My wife would go to bed, go to sleep at 12. My typewriter was completely silent. I sat in a dark room for 10 nights, not seeing what I wrote, and I typed the first 10 chapters of A Graveyard for Lunatics. 
my second murder mystery, huh? All because of that man with the destroyed face. He was Lon Chaney, huh? He was the hunchback. He was the phantom. He was the character in all these wonderful movies I saw when I was a kid. So this book, if you have a chance to get it, Graveyard of Red Lunatics, is all about the Phantom of the Opera, all about the hunchback, all about this man with the destroyed face, all about the studios, all about Ray Harryhausen, my great friend who created dinosaurs and animated them. I met him when I was 18. We, were, we had nowhere to go except to life, huh? Nowhere to go except to life. And our love of prehistoric monsters and we made a friendship, a loving friendship, which has lasted to this year. Huh? We promised to grow old together, but never to grow up. And always to love dinosaurs madly, no matter what anyone said, to love dinosaurs and King Kong and Fay Ray. Huh? <laughs> and my first film was The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms which Ray Harryhausen animated. Not a good film at all, but it was a beginning. It was a beginning. One of the great moments in our life was they had a re-premiere of King Kong at Grauman's Chinese 15 years ago, and they had a giant recreation of Kong in the outer lobby there, and they had Ray Harryhausen and me drive up in a car with all the flashing premiere lights. We got out and walked up into the forecourt and climbed up into the arms of King Kong, at which moment Fay Ray burst out of the crowd, ran up and kissed us both in the arms of Kong. Huh? You can't beat that, huh? <laughs> you, you can't buy that. You can't buy that. Huh? What you are all looking for, but maybe you don't know it, what you're looking for in your writing and your life is for one person to come up to you and say, I love you because of what you do. I love you for what you do. I had my first experience like that when Martian Chronicles was published in the spring of 1950. I, had, I didn't know what I had done. The book sold just 5,000 copies, that's all. But I took the train to New York for the publication of the book. I arrived in Chicago. I had two hours between trains. I walked over to the Art Institute to meet with a friend for lunch. I got there. I looked up at the top of the stairs. There were a bunch of tourists up there who were gathered for a tour, I guess. But all of a sudden, they turned and walked down the stairs to me. And all 20 of these tourists were holding a copy of the Martian Chronicles. Huh? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? They were my lovers. They were my lovers. I had never seen them before. And they handed their books over to be signed. And I knew what writing was all about. Huh? Not the money, not the money, but someone paying attention and saying, hey, you're okay. You're, you're not nuts the way the people said. <laughs> we love you, we love you. So uh, I've been all over the place tonight. I think, I hope I've given you enough important hints of, of the joy and the wonder of, of writing. There's still so much that we, I haven't said, and we'll have a chance to discuss this more and a chance for you to, to uh, ask questions. Um, so I'll go sit down now and we'll continue, okay? Thank you.